Uh, so good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, Mari, thank you, Anneli, thank you, Art Basel, and above, thank you. Uh, this is always the test of who are the serious uh, art aficionados and art issue aficionados, the ones who make it to this um, early morning session. Uh, this particular conversation started a year ago um, because we sort of tossed around various ideas of you know, what could be an interesting discussion. And um, we started talking about the issue of transparency in the art world um, and, and it, that it would be interesting to talk about transparency in the art world. It was actually prompted by our colleagues at the International Art Market Studies Association, of which Olaf is, I think, the president. Um, and uh, as we talked about it, we realized that this topic is, in fact, much bigger. What it's really about, this issue of transparency, is just one part of a much bigger puzzle, and it's about being a kind of modern industry. Um, so what we're here to talk about today is, is the art world a mature professional industry, uh, and are there some new rules um, that it should follow and so forth. So I'm going to sort of set the stage and hopefully we'll have a really intense uh, dialogue. We have certainly have plenty of us here this morning to explore it. Um, so um, I, look, the starting point is clearly that we have evolved from a fairly small, tradition-bound, person-to-person, quite insular world into a big commercially charged professional industry. Uh, everybody who lives around the art world has experienced this change. It happened rather suddenly in historical terms. Um, and we can agree or disagree about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but no one can doubt that we're in the midst of some huge transformations. And let me just point out six pretty obvious, huge, big chain changing patterns. One, we are certainly much larger, so we've gone from a tight-knit conversation to this big, global, sprawling uh, scene. Uh, we've obviously become much more international. Uh, all you have to do is walk around Art Basel uh, to see that. Spi prices have uh, absolutely skyrocketed, which is good news to some. Um, and like it or not, along with that, an investment mindset has entered uh, the art world. Also, the increasing prices have reconfigured the relationship of the commercial and the non-commercial sides of the art world, because non-commercial entities, museums, are more dependent on private entities than ever to do their work, and not especially for acquisitions. Uh, fourth, uh, along with all of these things have come more complex organizations, uh, lawyers, accountant, experts, PR support, strategy consultants even, and so on. Fifth, um, the art world pecking order has shifted. I think it's fair to say. The power is increasingly in the hands of those who have money, uh, and perhaps less in the hands of the expert establishment. We can talk about this later on. And sixth, and very obviously, technology is changing everything. So. Um, I'm sure there are other big things you can say, but these are some of the big uh, drivers of change in the art world. And uh, really the question for us today is, in this, given this new landscape, are there some new rules uh, to navigate and to structure behavior in this more complex landscape? Uh, and we've got a great cast of people uh, here uh, today. Lindsay Pollock, a journalist who's been covering the art market and the art world for a long time. Uh, Rob Rennie, the collector from Canada, also our um, businessman in chief on this panel who actually lives in the real world and makes money there. Uh, Adam Sheffer from Chime and Reed Gallery, also the president of the Art Dealers Association uh, of America. Pierre Valentin, art lawyer from London. And last but not least, just because of the alphabet, my fellow art sociologist, Olaf Veltui. So please give them a round of applause <laughs> for their brilliant <laughs> insights. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> we'll be performing Stairway to Heaven later on. Um, 
So I need to get out of the way, but just a couple quick observations, I promise I won't be long. Uh, one, um, despite evidence to the contrary, and you'll be hearing about this, the art world is uh, routinely, uh, as a matter of obvious facts, uh, described as an unregulated industry. We'll hear from some about to what de degree that's true. Uh, meanwhile, I think it's fair to say that governments around the world, uh, often starved for cash and looking for sources of revenue, are eyeing the art market as a potential source of taxation and, and regulation. Um, the art press, of course, uh, obliges us with a fairly steady drip of news stories about bad behavior in the art market. Truth be told, sometimes there's quite a, a bit of bad behavior out there. Um, so um, the, what we often hear are uh, calls to bring more order, more regulation, more sunlight into the affairs of the art world. Um, meanwhile, insiders in this world and frankly in every industry say self-regulation is the solution. It's not broke. Let's not try to fix it. Um, we're doing okay. Um, so part of our discussion today is sort of finding the balance. How much regulation is good? How much is bad? What would be the rules? And I've put our panelists on notice to at least make sure that we leave the room today with a few practical ideas about how we can uh, move forward. So with that in mind, I'm going to start with Lindsay. Uh, I've already introduced Lindsay a little bit, but just uh, I think everybody here knows that she's just ended a wildly successful uh, six-year tenure as the editor of Art in America, but she started out writing about uh, a wonderful book about Edith Halpert, the art deal dealer, and has been one of the truly great, and I have to say objective reporters for Bloomberg, Art Newspaper, New York Times, various places on the art scene. So with all of that objective uh, view, um, what can you say about the art world as a mature or immature industry. Thanks, Andraj, for that nice introduction. And good morning. Um, nice to see everybody here. I, um, well, interestingly enough, working on a biography of an art dealer who was an early 20th century dealer, opened a gallery in the 20s in Greenwich Village. Um, and I read her voluminous archive um, of hundreds of thousands of documents at the Smithsonian Archive of American Art. Uh, you know, in, in some ways, the art market has changed very little in terms of the fundamental model of the gallery, for instance, and the way that that business works. Um, so I think that's quite fascinating. But of course, um, you know, since I've been involved in the art world in the last couple of decades, I, I worked actually at Sotheby's in the early years of my career before becoming a journalist um, and seeing how things changed. I mean, first of all, the in incredible... Um, attention paid to contemporary art, which really was such a non-event uh, 20 years ago at Sotheby's. It was all about uh, impressionist and jewelry in terms of value and kind of resources and glamour and all glitz. So this has been qu kind of remarkable to watch uh, in the last decade, the sort of to you know attention paid to the field, which has been really exciting, and partly because of fairs like the one we're at and also auction prices and all of these things. People are curious, and of course that's interesting. One of the things, though, on the flip side, the dark side, um, and you know, I was one of the people in New York watching very carefully as something like the um, Salander O'Reilly case unfolded, where a dealer uh, who was, um, you know, selling um, predominantly old master paintings um, ended up um, running into a lot of financial trouble and um, not paying um, sellers, not you know, doing a lot of things, and ended up in jail. And when I was covering that case, um, I felt like it would be a good lesson for a lot. I sat around the courtroom when he was being sentenced, you know, in tears he was, and his family was there. But really no one else from the art world was there, and I thought it would be such a good lesson if everybody had to kind of sit in this courtroom and see the end result of what can happen. Because I don't think people always intend on the f beginning to wind up in that kind of a situation, but because there is this kind of wild west um, in the art market, um, because there are, um, there are very few kind of guidelines and rules, um, this is what, could, in the worst case scenario, can happen. And again, this was extremely rare, and I've written about the art world for so long, and it, you know there aren't there aren't that many dramatic cases quite like this. Although, of course, Nodler 
was um, relatively recently of, of, of the same kind of level, um, potentially. Um, but you know, I, just using an example from this week, you know, uh, in the New York Times, they reported that Aggie Gund sold a Lichtenstein painting for $165 million. She was quoted um, clarifying, saying, I sold it for $165 million. She's setting up a nonprofit. And to Steve Cohen. And it just really struck me like, wow, to have that information just so clearly articulated from the seller, naming the buyer, naming the price, wow, you know, it was just very refreshing because I remember having to chase people down aisles and auction rooms and whatever to get sort of no comment um, for all those years. And so that was really a nice moment. But, um, you know, I, I understand, look, and I think between the Wild West and the overly regulated, let's say, finance industry, where it's all compliance driven, where, you know, business is really stifled and, and it's very difficult to do things. Um, there's got to be some middle ground for the art world fundamentally. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the answers are, but you know, where there are such conflicts of interest, I mean, just to point out a couple, is, if mm -hmm. I may. One, you know, the auction houses, when I was working in that industry, you know, it was a neutral platform. It was agnostic. They did not go into artists' studios and get work to be consigned. They did not operate as dealers. And these days, you know, if you're buying an apartment, you get the broker gives you a form that they, you have to sign that says, I am representing you or I'm representing the buyer. It's clear who is being who is being represented. When a new person or you know a smart person who maybe hasn't been around the art world for long walks into let's say an auction house now, I'm not sure how clear it is who's being represented because it's they're doing so many things and uh, it's in an effort to make profits because that's a very tough business. I get it. But at the same time, you know, let's have some clarity and um, the other thing I would say, and again, I don't want to, I know this is being uh, taped in, in hmm. perpetuity, <laughs> but anyway, I'll just say Pino, you know, was a really interesting figure and a polemical figure because he's a collector, he's someone who owns one of the major auction houses. He also uh, has these private museums that are very high profile. He's doing this show, which I'm going to see next week, I guess, hmm. in Venice, this Damien Hirsch show. Is that work for sale? Is it not for sale? I mean, what's happening? It's just very confusing and there used to be these in terms of self-regulation a bit more um, of a sense of boundaries and I think the fluidity today has upside mm -hmm. but it also has potential for for concern mm -hmm. so, so on the one yeah. hand things aren't changing as much but they're actually changing quite a lot before we move on and we do have to move on and not to put you on the spot speaking for all of the press. Do you think the press provides an objective sense of the art world's affairs? Oh, I think it's having been, I mean, it's very, first of all, very difficult, you know, having to, to find out what's happening. I often felt when I would run around an art fair in order to report, let's say, for the art newspapers, Fair Daily, this is gonna sound very cynical, but I wish I had a lie detector test, because who is <laughs> going to, when I say, how is, did you make any sales? How was your sale? It's, it's not in the self-interest of the gallerist to, mm -hmm. to say, oh, this that's a terrible affair. I didn't sell anything. I'm sure Art Basel would be delighted to invite the person back next year, or whatever right. the case may be. Imagine going around the stock exchange saying to the broker, well, how did it go? You yeah. know, did you sell the IBM stock? Yeah. So I think, I mean, there, there, look, at, there, there's, a, there's a diminishment in the number of journalists that are out there. Publications are not particularly strong. Media is not very strong for many systemic reasons. This is not the, the pinnacle of art journalism in terms of th th this period, I'd say, that we're in right now. So, yeah. I mean, I'd like to hear my, my fellow yeah. panelists. Well, we're we are about I'm, to do that. I'm going to get emotional <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, okay, well, we'll bring Lindsay back, uh, but we'll move on to someone, uh, Bob Rennie, who as I said, is our um, uh, token real-world businessman as well, but most more importantly uh, for us, is uh, one of the great uh, collectors who began his collection about 30 years from in 1974, I think, when you were 18, and bought a Norman Rockwell, uh, and now has an extraordinary uh, museum in Vancouver and a collection of close to 400 objects, um, uh, many artists that you collect in depth. Uh, you're a very successful real estate business that helps you do this. You're also quite involved in a number of institutions from the Tate uh, to the Art Institute in Chicago. So as a collector, but also as an active businessman in the real world, what is your view of the art world as a kind of business? Well, uh, 
with the question, even the word mature industry, industry brings in commerce. Right. Like it's but commerce so is it, a part of what we're talking about. It just keeps coming into it. So this is only the second time I've, I've done this. I, I, I was a speaker at uh, Armories for Deloitte's, and there was a hedge fund guy, there was a syndicator, and there was a, a, an art lawyer, and I was the collector, and I spoke, and then th there was two journalists that, were on yeah. a, that spoke together. Quickly, their conversation turned into Oscar Murillo's prices, as opposed to speaking about art. And as we left, I said to my son, I said, based on what we've seen this afternoon, we gotta get out. This mm -hmm. isn't where we belong, because we're trying to collect artists in depth, um, we spend a lot of time trying to have access, so guys like um, Adam will return, will return my call. But it's not where we belong on this commerce side. But then as we walked out, I said, seeing that, I didn't use the word mature then, but seeing is it's not matured. I think the access to information, as Lindsay was going down that path, is the really big change that's happened since the internet. You know, we're all carrying our iPhone, but we want old world practices back. It's gone. We have to admit to, to, to where things have changed. But I said to my son, now that we see what's happening today and you see syndicates and you see the legal ease involved and you see all the positioning, this is an emerging market. So what we've done over the last 30 years putting a collection together is safe. You know, our, our, what we want to be as a collector is a very safe custodian for artists so that when, when we collect, um, it's not going to be at auction next week. The, the speculation is out. I can't lie, the long term, of course, is there. This is, this is mm -hmm. family's money and you're looking for a safe place. But it is secondary because my view of the art world is one third of the art that you purchase, and we want to go down the businessman commerce end, one third of the art that you purchase will make more than any financial instrument you could ever, you could ever touch. One third uh, may keep up with the cost of living, and one third we should just sit there and burn money. <laughs> but you won't know for 15 years which silo that and art how, went how, into. How, do, how does the whole portfolio do for you? And you invited me here. <laughs> uh, so uh, we've been very fortunate that we were, we were following artists in the 90s, such as, 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 as uh, I'll use Kerry James Marshall, yeah. that, that nobody was looking and we spanned his career and we built relationships with the dealer, we built relationships with the, with the artist. One thing, um, we were talking, I think it was with Adam back, and. I claim that we do not have any curators. We do all of this with our with our our, mm -hmm. our own eye. But it is the relationships with curators, with museums, with gallerists that educate us. We can pretend we're doing it ourselves. And I'm always very critical of the difference between collecting with your ear and collecting with your eye. Um, you do collect with your eye, but your ear is involved because you 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 want information, and that transparency that's available in the Agnes Gun Sale that, that you relate to is really important for all of us. But then, when you talk about Mr. Pinot, and I'm sorry, I don't know him, but that art is for sale. It is a a, a different commercial gallery space mm -hmm. under the pretense of. Of a, of a museum, and we're often very critical of that practice, but we, we just have to say it exists. It's a parallel universe. And is that a kind of price we pay for evolving and becoming bigger? I mean, in many other industries, you see roles shifting around, or is there a value judgment attached to what you just said? Well, I, I think his signature on it does something, does something yeah. for it, but if we look at the museum practice that looking at myself, we want to be a good custodian and end up making sure that these artists end up in safe places in museums, that, that the private collector has taken on a larger and a larger role. 
Um, I think the private collector has to be careful that they don't become the dictators of taste. Mm -hmm. And then when, but, but on the on the Damien Hirst, we love to complain about it. But I sort of uh, my analogy is: I tell you I'm looking for a new car, and you tell me to go look at a Bugatti. It's not a car; it's a parallel universe. <laughs> it has four wheels, but it has nothing to do with what you may be doing in art world. Yet we're so quick to criticize it. But I don't care what happens at a Bugatti yeah. dealership. I don't right. belong there, right, right, right. but I might be worried about the BMW yeah. dealer because I think they're the sponsor of this. Last <laughs> question. <we'll> <laughs> before, we, we, before we go on, just one last question uh, because we'll get back to this issue later. How is life different as a collector now for you than 25 years ago when you were unknown? You, you, you now walk into a gallery and you're a big deal. How is that different from a transaction and access standpoint for you? First of all, I'm Canadian, so we're extremely passive aggressive. We will not admit that we have that that clout, but you know, I, it changed in 1999 for us very clearly. Uh, we acquired uh, Mike Kelly's Detroit Reclamation Project, mm -hmm. and I found that when I mentioned that, I got into the club. Mm -hmm. That, that was a, a, such a, a big obvious shift that all of a sudden when you said that you were willing to take on not, not only an amazing artist but a very challenging work by an amazing artist, that the conversation changed completely, that we all of a sudden got access to maybe works that other collectors couldn't become the custodians of. Right. So that was the game changer. You know, the world got better for us financially, so we were able to make better moves, but we're not trophy hunters, right. and we never have right. been, so none of that changed. But I think that the dissemination of information combined with um, uh, be boastful, a respected collection gives you access. You know, I'd say to anyone in this room, it doesn't matter how much money you have, try and get a Mark Bradford. Right. Just try and get one. Right. Money won't do it. You have to have a museum relationship. You have to you 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 have to have a collection that has shoulders that speak to this work. It may be a minor player or a large player in your collection, but there is there is going to be qualifiers right. put with it. And whether we like that or not, it just exists. Right. Okay. So it's only logical that now we go to Adam as our practicing art dealer. Um, he's been in, in this role in, in some ways around the art world for 25 years. As I said, he's now the head of the Art De Dealers Association back in New York. Uh, at Chime and Reed since 2003. Before that, you were at Robert Miller with Mary Boone. So you've seen a lot. Um, you're also, you actually studied archaeology. You're working on a film. You're working on a book. You're a man of many skills. First of all, how's the fair going for you? Terrific, actually. Um, and one, it, of it our best I mean, one of our best fairs yet. And how, and how is it different from the past? Um, well, first of all, thank you, Andras, for inviting me Pleasure. Uh, this year. Even though I said no a lot, <laughs> um, you did. the fact that um, my friends Lindsay and Bob Rennie were going to be here in particular, um, because I like the... Um, directness and sincerity with which they speak that Indeed. had a lot to do with it. So thank you. Um, I feel this year that um, as every year in Art Basel, people bring their A-game. Mm -hmm. This is the chance to show off really what you're made of. Um, we have had fewer sales this year, but sort of uh, more ambitious sales mm -hmm. at higher price levels mm -hmm. and all to new people. Right. Amazing. So that tells you that there's new new people coming into this world, or is it just you? I think it's the quality of the material that we brought mm -hmm. and our ability as a gallery to be articulate uh, promoters and defenders of our program right. and for people to understand where they fit in in art history and how it may speak to them personally mm -hmm. and um, their relationship to that work. I mean, presumably anyone who comes to Art Basel wants to have, in some form, a life in art, yeah. whether as a collector, a journalist, um, an, a patron, an art lover, mm -hmm. curator, etc. Um, 
And you have to understand that. And it gets back to this very notion that um, the entire art world is about relationships and it's built on relationships. And one of the reasons why I said no to this panel so many times is because I wasn't sure about the mm. title. Mm. You know, when you say mature, do you mean um, mature in terms of time limits or in terms of behavior? Because in terms of time limits, you could say we are among one of the world's oldest professions, mm -hmm. and that has certain analogies to it. <laughs> and at the same time, you could say mature in terms of behavior. Um, the other thing is when I started working in galleries, sweeping floors and painting walls, which I still do, um, there was no industry, there was no art business, there was no, there was the art world and the art world consisted of a group of people who had some sort of foundation of interest in being a part of something that was both emotional and visual and intellectual. And I will never forget um, in, I think it was January of 1990 or thereabouts, Art in America um, had uh, came out with an issue and it had a Joseph Boys on the cover and it said Kunst equals Kapital. And it was like a very defining moment that the mm -hmm. game had changed. And yeah. all of these romantic notions that I had had about the art world um, sort of snapped into position and mm -hmm. I had to sort of think about things differently. Mm -hmm. I think also when you're learning about art, when you're studying art history and you're a student and then you go sort of behind the front desk mm -hmm. and you start to learn mm -hmm. that this is a business, that there are real machinations by mm -hmm. which um, things operate and you support artists and make a profit, that it is much more, um, there are much more many requirements to filling that role than simply loving art and talking about it. Right. Well, actually, that was my question. I would like to focus on the other side of the title, which is the new rules. You're somebody who, so let's acknowledge the life has changed. It is a very different world, mature, whatever label you want to put on it. Uh, you're also the head of this association, so you spend a lot of time talking to your colleagues in New York. I assume, and not just uh, across America. Um, do you feel that, as many journalists would claim, for example, that 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 there needs to be some new rules of the road, some new regulations brought into this? How would that work? What are your what's your take on that? Well, I think this is the beauty and the importance of having um, associations mm -hmm. of the best art dealers. Mm -hmm. in whatever geographical area we're talking about. I mean, mm -hmm. the ADAA, the Art Dealers Association of America, was founded in 1962, and it was founded by a group of dealers in order to promote the interests and best practices of art gallery owners. Mm -hmm. We have a code of ethics. We have uh, a code of standards and practices. Mm -hmm. We inform our dealers on the changes in taxation and important codes that are going on on a statewide and a federal level. Mm -hmm. uh, we advocate on behalf of art dealers and artists in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. We keep them constantly informed of changes that are going on or potential changes, such as in the case of the NEA mm -hmm. and the rulings of our new president. Um, one of the things that we did, um, I, I'm also on the board of a wonderful organization that's called Talking Galleries. It's oh, yeah. a global organization that's based in Barcelona, and it is probably what one would consider the Davos of the art world. And Talking Galleries, uh, which has had meetings internationally, but Barcelona is the forum, um, meets and talks about these really important issues. And we went to Korea, and I spoke to the Korean Art Dealers Association in Seoul last November mm -hmm. about the fact that having an association is more than just having a gallery weekend or a gallery night. This means having a code of ethics, um, making sure that people prescribe to them, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that you keep them updated about changes, and it was all new information to them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's up to us as art dealers to make sure that this becomes a more and more mature industry by doing the work to inform people about what the good things are that we do. 
Great. Well, and we'll get back to this question of self-regulation in a minute, but I want to move on, thank you, Adam, uh, to Pierre, um, who is uh, with Constantine Cannon, running their art law practice out of London. You work with galleries, museums, collectors, art funds, auction houses, you name it. Uh, you were Associate General Counsel at Sotheby's, so you've also seen a lot. So now, as a, uh, from the, you've heard all these fine people describe the situation, but with your lawyer's hat on, I'm wondering, um, first of all, do you consider it an unregulated industry, um, and where do you see the need for change? Um, I think to say that the art market is an unregulated market is nonsense. Um, uh, two, three years ago, uh, my firm was asked by the British Art Market Federation um, to list um, all the laws and uh, regulations applying in the United Kingdom. Um, and we listed 167 um, laws and regulations. That is just for the United Kingdom. Some of these laws and regulations come from Brussels, some are Westminster made, some uh, are international treaties like UNESCO, UNIDROIT, etc. Um, some apply, a few uh, apply or are, are aimed directly at the art market, uh, export of cultural goods, uh, antiquities, etc. Um, the vast majority are laws and regulations that apply to all businesses, including. Um, galleries, auction houses, um, etc. So to say the art market is not regulated, is, uh, not regulated, I think, is is not true. What is true, though, is that there isn't um, a um, a regulatory body overseeing the workings of the art market, like there is in the financial sector, in the insurance market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think the the key question, perhaps, is would that be a good idea to have a regulatory body? Now, I have my own view on regulatory bodies, um, which is not particularly favorable. Um, uh, that comes from personal experience. Um, the legal profession is regulated, uh, and my personal experience of that has not been good. Um, look at what's happened um, in the financial sector. You know, there isn't a week when, um, you know, there isn't a, a, a bank a banking-related scandal, yet um, the financial industry, the banking sector, is probably one of the most regulated sector. The only, to my knowledge, the yeah, only... but we're nicer people. We're nicer people. We're nicer True. people. <laughs> True. Um, uh, which doesn't say a great deal about uh, French auctioneers, because French <laughs> auctioneers are regulated. Uh, it's probably the only, to my knowledge, it's probably the only um, part of the art market that is regulated. Um, uh, the Conseil des Ventes, which is the regulatory body in France, was set up in 2000, I think. Um, and for about seven, eight years, they presided over the greatest scandal um, that ever happened, I think, in the uh, auction market, which was the, uh, the porters at, the, at Paris, uh, the Paris uh, Drew market, uh, stealing um, in open daylight, mm -hmm. some of whom were convicted and are now spending time in prison. Um, so you wonder what was the Conseil de Vente doing whilst this was going on. Um, I mean, there are many reasons, I would say, why a, a regulator uh, is not always the right answer. Um, I mean, it's certainly, you know, lack of poor compliance monitoring is an issue um, because a lot of people working for these regulators are box stickers and paper pushers. Um, and they don't always, you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's you know, they're, they're very sort of rigid in their approach. Um, they don't keep up with the pace of change. I mean, the art world, you know, the, the business models we see in the art worlds evolve all the time. Um, and in my experience, by the time the regulator catches, the regulator catches up, um, they're five years behind. Um, Plus, perhaps most importantly, I think it's very difficult to regulate a market that is as international as the art market. Because the minute you start regulating generally on a national level, um, then you make that those who operate in that market less competitive vis-a-vis -vis other markets. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yes, international standards can be uh, agreed, 
but that takes years and years and years and years. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I would be very concerned if, um, if the United Kingdom, for example, were um, talking about introducing a, a, a regulator for the uh, British hard market. I don't think it's going to happen, by the way. I don't think there's any appetite there is for that. There's um, currently a plan to do that? No. No. No, thank God for that. Yeah. So um, uh, and we're going to keep moving on because this is a subject that we'll return to, but it's interesting. We've now had a kind of um, very beautiful statement about self-regulation and associations. We've had a very skeptical legal statement about uh, regulation. Um, and now on to our uh, sociologist in, re in residence, that's Olaf, uh, who I know you have a take on this. I'm, I'm, I also am a sociologist and uh, one of the few people who wrote a dissertation on art dealers, actually, so we've known our work uh, very well over the years. You're at the University of Amsterdam. Many books and articles to your name. My favorite, which I've also taught a lot, is your book, Talking Prices, Symbolic Meanings of Prices on the Market for Contemporary Art. And as, a so as any sociologist would be, <coughs> you're interested in the sort of <coughs> symbolic meanings of all this, and you have a different take on uh, regulation and unregulation. Uh, I think I heard you once say that it's precisely the unregulated nature of this world that attracts people to it. So what's your take on uh, everything you, you've heard so far? Well, I have to switch this on now. Is it yeah, just going hold on? it. Yeah, that's good. To begin with, I think it would be good to put things a bit in perspective. Um, and maybe the size of the market. The question for me would be, is it worth to regulate to begin with? I mean, we tend to think that the art market is almost the center of the universe and has been expanding so much. But still, if you look at the total revenue of the market globally, it depends a bit on the report you read these days because there are several now, but it will be somewhere between 40 and 60 billion US dollars. I just looked up the turnover of Walmart only in the United States, one firm, and it is 500 billion US dollars. So let alone if you would compare it to any financial market, the art market is just tiny. The question really is, is it worth regulating? The other thing is, I think we have a tendency to, to think or you, I like to take the outsider's perspective, you have a tendency to think in the art market that everything is new, that it has become so financialized, that it has become so globalized, that you, you what you were mentioning in your introductory statement, that technology has completely reshaped the market. I think it's quite exaggerated. If you compare it to other creative industries, compare Art Basel here, this show mm. to Art Basel 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and then compare the music industry nowadays mm -hmm. to 20 That's years true. ago. I don't think all that much has changed, and there I would really sympathize with how you started, that the way art dealers work and the way you talk to collectors, I think it's actually quite similar to the way you talked to them 20 years ago and the way you made a sale 20 years ago. You wouldn't say that in other creative industries. You wouldn't say that in the music industry or in the movie industry mm -hmm or in the book industry, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So change has not been all that, all that uh, great. Globalization, the same thing. Yes, it is a much more global market than it used to be. But hey, it is still also very local. I talk to a lot of dealers who still have a very small group of clients that they talk to very regularly that very often are in their vicinity. They may uh, run into some people from all around the world at the fairs, but still it's a very local market. Don't overestimate mm. how global it is. And the same for financialization. I think what the art market has in common with the financial market is an extremely short memory. Mm -hmm. The art market has been financialized in many periods before. In the early 1900s, there were investment firms. Picasso's biggest uh, buyers in the beginning, in his early years, was an investment firm. Po de Luz, a group of investors who pulled money together and bought works by Picasso and Braque, and then 10 years later, sold them off for a handsome profit. Same in the 1960s. 
there was a huge investment interest in art in those days. It was the first time that there was an art index, like a financial index, like the Dow Jones of the art market was established in the 1960s, or take the 1980s, another moment of financialization. So the art market, it's not like in a uni, in one direction going more global, more financialized, more So how are things different? I don't think they are that different. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and that is what you, mm. how you introduced me, one of the things is this, well, I like to look at it almost not as a sociologist, but, but like an anthropologist. It's a, it's a, for me, it's a, it's a group of people that have a very, very strong professional ethos and a very, how, how would I call it? Well, an, an unregulated ethos in the sense that business is done in a not so formal way with a handshake, with gentlemen's agreements, maybe a little bit less than it used to be, but still, it is, it's, um, it is that part of the market that makes it attractive to people. The whole, the whole spiel about the waiting lists and about getting access and not getting access, which, by the way, functions for me, mm -hmm. as a sociologist, also as a kind of a status mechanism. Okay, yeah. That is part of where the worth of the art market is that people that are new, newly wealthy, that are not just in need of hanging something on their walls or putting together a collection, but also understanding where they are in this global cultural elite, mm -hmm. that is what the art market is doing. And that is also why it needs to partially keep this unregulated uh, character, would I say in a rather provocative way. <laughs> it's always great to have an academic in any conversation because your fundamental assumptions will be challenged, and I welcome that. But Adam, I saw you, I couldn't tell if you were nodding or shaking your head, I couldn't tell. I was merely reacting because I had a thought. Okay, good, that's a good was, thing was to was have. Being said. And it was not necessarily um, an aggressive so uh, thought, it was a realistic thought, and it sort of uh, takes this conversation a step further. And I wish that I could say that I were some genius who came up with this mm. concept, but that's not the case, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Um, at Talking Galleries two years ago, our mm -hmm. keynote speaker was Mark Spiegler. Mm -hmm. And he gave this wonderful presentation about um, 10 things every gallerist should be asking themselves right now. One of the things that came up, um, which I agreed wholeheartedly with him, was this idea that, with very few exceptions, and maybe Bob is one of them. We have a different kind of collector these days than, say, the Havermeyers were when they were going around with Mary Cassatt to buy paintings. We have people for whom art collecting is no longer a leisure class activity, okay? I'm not saying that they're treating it as a business, but these people are busy. Their lives are amped up. They have a lot of technology. Mm -hmm. The stimulation is going. They are making their money and spending their money at the same time. The advent of the art fair um, is something that even as someone who is involved in the gallery progress, um, I actually really like art fairs because in our gallery, uh, John Chime uses the gallery and uses art fairs as a platform to curate sort of another group show. It allows us, we're not a multi-venue gallery, we're a mm. single venue gallery, I'm very mm. proud of it. It's a mm. family affair. But we can use the art fair to curate something so that there are trends, or it's quite beautiful that way. Mm. There are relationships between the artists. People can come in, people who are working, who can't take every Saturday to go and look at art, who can't spend the way they did in the 90s, or their parents may have done, a whole afternoon in Soho to come in, sit down, order in a sandwich, and look at 10 Joan Mitchell paintings. You know, things have sped up. And for them, people who are making money, earning money, often in the financial sector, where they're dealing with markets around the world, this allows them the opportunity to see the maximum amount of merchandise mm -hmm. uh, 
see the most amount of things in a condensed period of time. So I feel like the market has gone with the kind of person that exists as an art collector today. So I don't necessarily think it's a fault of the gallery or the fault of the collector mm -hmm. or something that's more epidemic. I think mm -hmm. it's merely organic. We live in times of cell phones and iPhones and, mm -hmm. and all of this Wi-Fi technology and we're just kind of keeping up with our times. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, uh, fair enough, and uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting to just see these viewpoints. You had a, a comment. Uh, on, on your comment about Walmart and the art market, the art market today, um, use social media, use technology, you don't think has changed it, but it takes up a lot of space. So when the Giacometti or the $110 million basket sale takes place, it becomes water cooler conversation. When there's a sale on at Walmart and Tide is a dollar off, nobody talks about it. And it, so <laughs> it's, it is very disproportionate for the amount of space it takes up culturally. So I do think that technology has, has changed it. You know, you're the, you're the, the sociologist, but it, the the, the conversations that go with it and the qualifiers and getting into those conversations, the media is pumping out that information to you that it's really only doing Walmart if, you, mm -hmm. if you're invested in the stock play. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I do disagree with you a bit that the technology has changed where the art market has gone to. I still stand by, there's a lot of parallel universes and we just have to understand it and understand which lane you're in. Right. Um, we, we, it, it, it's, it's always good to have disagreement, and in fact, there's a great deal of disagreement because several of you have started out saying the world has changed profoundly, some disagree, and that's all good uh, because it is, in fact, a moment of uh, transformation. It, it's a confusing world. We know we've heard uh, we maybe we could benefit from more rules, but we sort of don't want to have more rules. We sort of desire transparency, but we also value the privacy of, of the business. We sort of uh, can be a little bit nostalgic about the intimacy of the old art world, but at the same time, we clearly benefit from the bigness of the current art market. So I want to go, uh, we have about a half an hour to just go a little deeper. I want to make sure there's some questions. Um, and yes, let's focus on the commercial side of things. I want to ask about two things, and I'm going to ask you a very simple question Maybe we could even rate the art world on this. First of all, is the current system fair? You know, most industries, one of the precepts of m uh, modern, mature industries is that there should be a fairly level playing field. One market participant shouldn't enjoy special privileges over other market participants. One consumer shouldn't be excluded from another. That is the topic when you're talking about, let's say, communications issues, right? It's a, f it's a question of, Fairness. Do we have this in the art world? Anyone? Is it a fair industry? I've never had this conversation with Adam, but Mary Boone, who is a god of the art world, uh, you may have worked there then, but this was in the early 90s, and I had bought a work off of Transparency. I had never been to New York. Came out to New York, and I walked into Mary Boone's gallery, and two very, very, very handsome men, I think you were one of them, stood behind the desk while a lady was at a typewriter, a typewriter then, and I said, is Mary Boone in? And both gentlemen shook their head, no. And they could see my hesitation. I'm there in my bulky ski jacket, and they said, was she expecting you? And I said, no, I just told her if I was ever in town, my name's Bob. I didn't even get out Rennie. The lady jumped up from the typewriter and said, hi, Bob, I'm Mary Boone. <laughs> so that is the part of the art world that is not an equalizer. You know, when Oprah Winfrey can't get into Hermes, it makes the news, but these things happen every single day, and that's the part that as a collector, you know, we've always wanted access. You earn that right and you get access, but I'm not saying it's fair, it just exists. And the Mary Boone story, I think, is rampant within the industry, mm -hmm. and there's that... Does that get people in th that want to compete more, or does it push people out of the market? But it certainly ex it certainly exists. So, it, so what does the art world get? Is a 
a, a D or where where would you? Well, oh, I, I think on the on, fair. Uh, on there it's it's a fail. It's a fail. But, Pierre, I but, saw you. You were you, you were sh you were shaking your. What were you? It's supposed to say if you want to look after the artist's career and you want it to go to safe places, but that that deserves a discussion. And Mary Boone wasn't going to have that discussion with some guy in a torn ski jacket that's coming in. But Any, anyone else on this? How fair? How unfair? I, I, you know, I totally, I totally agree with, with, with you, Bob. I mean, I, I see that all, all the time as well. Um, there's also the fact that because of because there is a lack of transparency, um, you know, the power is with those who have the information, um, and that's also unfair in a way because you know information is is carefully guarded, um, and yes, technology has um, has open that up, but only, in my opinion, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, whether, what will happen in the next 20 years, I don't know. Uh, but I suspect more and more information will become available, mm -hmm. whether this information will be voluntarily disclosed or, you know, there may be regulation regard, uh, and regulations that will create imposing. A greater a greater, so yeah, a level playing field, I would say. Now, Olaf, is this, what he says, he just gave the art world a fail, is for you, is this a kind of beautiful anthropological feature? I only give it a fail with that aspect of it. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of passes out right. there. Okay, good. Maybe even the A's in certain areas. But how it, well, where so do you come in? I, I definitely agree that it is not a living play of playing field. I mean, these, it's an extremely hierarchical market. It's a market that is all about making distinctions all the time between different people, between, of course, different artists, but especially like these types of things. And, and it's everywhere. It's of course also here at Art Basel who, who gets the attention of the dealer and who doesn't, who gets the, what kind of VIP access you get to the fair. It's all about making distinctions, but I mean, it's not just personally that as an outsider, this makes for an extremely fascinating market. And probably I would not have been studying this market for so long had it not had those aspects. But I think seriously that it, this is also the dynamics of the market. So you can give it a fail for it, but if you would take it away, you would take a lot of the dynamics of the art market away. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that, that goes to transparency as well. I mean, if you all like transparency so much, well then just start putting up price tags everywhere mm -hmm. and nobody wants to do it. And if you wouldn't, if you would do it, it would change the so game completely. So it's the price to pay. It is for where we are. So, yeah. so, so you're sort of agnostic on this issue, actually. Oh, I'm not agnostic. I, I, uh, I like it as an as an academic, and I think it is important. It is an important part of the dynamics of the market. This, the fact that it is not a living play, playing field, is part of what gets the market going uh -huh. and what but attracts people to to the market because they want to make sure that the next time Mary Boone jumps uh, from her chair right away. But it's not a cause for concern. I'll leave that to so others. Okay, so let's, uh, does anybody want to give a, okay, here, no, no, here, you. Just very briefly. Um, Bob, I remember that very event. Um, thank you for your wildly inaccurate description of me, but I appreciate it. Um, I Actually, he was at the time, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I just want to make sure that we're not talking about generalizations either, because I really think it comes from the top down in individual galleries. That is not the culture at Chime and Reed. Mm -hmm. It's a very friendly, very user friendly environment. Mm -hmm. Our people at the front desk are informative, they are um, highly educated, mm -hmm. they are kind and um, very engaging. Mm -hmm. And that's because that is the kind of culture for our business that we want to create. And it's been a secret of our success. Mm -hmm. Other galleries choose to work in another sort of mode of operation. And because we are privately owned and we do not have shareholders, I believe, um, mm -hmm. et cetera, um, we can make these decisions. So um, not every gallery operates this way, but right. I certainly know that quite a few do. OK, next question. Uh, because I, I rather like the dynamic here. So just a simple question, which I think is something one asks of other industries. 
or whatever we want to call this, is the system working optimally? That is to say, in economic terms or however you measure its effectiveness, uh, is it delivering the best results for its participants? I, you know, however you define the optimum of the art world, is, is this world sort of firing on all spark plugs? Is it delivering the maximum benefits that it could deliver? Just very briefly, yeah. I think there's never been a better time to be an artist and to have the potential to have a thriving career. And mm -hmm. I think that's because there are so many supportive galleries mm -hmm. out there. So I'm so not saying it's optimal, but I am saying that the opportunities are bigger than they've ever been before so for artists and estates and foundations. And that's really at the core of what we do. So is that an A minus? B plus. B plus. Anyone else? Lindsay? I mean, I, I don't know. There's a million things running through my head because all, on all of these fronts, it depends what perspective you're looking well, at yes. in terms of the fairness. Ex well, so obviously, for somebody that was my good, hidden question. For somebody is bad. I mean, I'm just, here's an example. Yeah. I was at the auction previews in May in New York, which I hadn't been to for years, and I just went out as a, almost an anthropologist, and there was this collection from a couple who were in the fashion industry. I don't know why it was being sold. There were glamorous photos of their house. There were every name-checked contemporary artist. The collection looked like it had been put together in the last five years. Each example was not good. And you wondered, who's advising them? They're paying top dollar. This collection, it looks not great. And I bet that they did not recoup whatever they had spent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just wonder, optimally, you know, I've, you know, on the one hand, you can be very cynical and get people say, which is, you know, people get the collection that they deserve, depending on how much effort one puts in and research and so forth, which is a very cynical thing to say. And, you know, if you're going to phone it in, Adam, and you're not going to sit in the gallery and have a sandwich, at least, um, maybe you're going to get the worst out of the 10 examples that that artist might have produced in the past couple of years. But, you know, at the same time, maybe there's there's an kind of evening out and maybe it all balances out. But mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, optimization, like, I mean, this issue of the, the ethos of customer service. I mean, first of all, is there fair, fairness anywhere right now? You know, I'm, I'm mortified, but I buy most of my stuff from Amazon. I feel terrible for every store, you know, in New York City that is closing. They predict 20, 30% of retail is gonna close in New York City, in, in, the, the, in the United States in the near future. Like, that's a, that's a real seismic shift. So is, is, there, is anything fair? No, right now. Uh, is the art world fair? Certainly not. It's it it it's based on this sort of um, you know closed door mentality, and it's that's the way it operates. And you know you can really, although I will say I don't know someone alluded to this, and Bob, this I think has shifted since you've gone into the collecting. I mean, I, I hear about collectors. I was at a party the other night, and somebody in, within a, sort of a five year time frame, by by you know by being creative, attractive, and extremely rich can become a real persona in the art world. You can really self-invent and become a, um, a figure. And maybe you open a private museum when, you know, five years ago, you, you didn't go to art museums. You didn't. And I think part of this has created a culture of people who become trustees at museums quickly, who then make decisions that aren't healthy for institutions. We've seen a lot of turmoil um, in museums, mm -hmm. I think, because boards board trustees who used to have a long-term, I mean, this could go, this is a different panel perhaps, yeah. but you know where I'm well, headed. Let, <laughs> let, me, let, let me just keep us going with some questions. So first of all, I just note the fact that our panel, it, it seems, it seems to feel that it's not a very fair system, but it's actually doing okay. That's kind of what I'm hearing. Um, so that leads me to my next simple question. Uh, uh, Pierre, you mentioned, I think you counted, if I heard the number, 100 and 67 regulations. Is that enough? Not enough? Too many? How do you all feel? Well, I think it's not about quantity, it's about quality. And uh, I think what, what we need, not just for the art market, but by the way, but you know, um, in other sectors as well, we need, we need better regulation. Um, that's one. And the second thing is, I think we have plenty of regulations. Um, we don't need more, we need more better enforcement. Um, and I'm thinking particularly in areas such as uh, competition, uh, antitrust, and um, consumer protection. Um, uh, the problem is today um, not enough resources are, are invested in, um, in enforcement. Um, and, that, and that includes criminal, uh, the criminal justice system. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think if, if the laws and regulations we have today were better enforced, then, um, you know, then the, the, the sort of uh, shadier areas of the art market um, may uh, recede. Uh -huh. Do you all, anyone on that topic? Olaf? Well, maybe one comment about what type of regulation we don't need as far as I'm concerned, and that is, it is talked about quite a lot, so some kind of insider trading equivalent mm -hmm. for the art market, and I, so, so the idea then would be that some collectors would have access to, for instance, information about a solo show in a museum coming up and then buy the work beforehand and to, to, to get rid of that type of speculation uh, speculation regulation will be necessary and I think it's 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 again it's something that it's a couple of cases where that may have happened in the art market it's not at all clear how what the impact is and when the impact is of such a museum show on, on prices yes it has an impact but it's part of a much bigger picture of other signals that other mm, museums institutions are sending so I don't I really don't think that is where we should be I going. I should mention at this point, I once had a graduate student who tested that proposition by actually looking at um, prices of artists who have recently had museum shows, and he found that there was no correlation. In fact, the artists who did not have museum shows had <coughs> more uh, price growth because <coughs> the ones who had the museum shows already had their success priced in. So another one of those areas where I think we need a better journalism. Bob, you work in the real estate business, which is quite regulated, I think. Uh, how would you compare the two industries in this respect? It, I, I've used for all our businesses that, I'll swear here, 4% of the world are assholes, and we spend 96% of our time trying to deal with them. And that, <laughs> that is unfortunate that it exists in the art world, it exists, it exists in, in, the, in the real estate world. But I, just, I, I told you my sad story, but a positive story, probably with Chime and Reed, I've spent $25,000 in the last 30 years. I bought one work. But I looked at a very important work with Howard Reed, who I think is, is here. Uh, we don't have a deep relationship, but Howard spent hours with us. Mm -hmm. And I had to offer a payment scheme because we're always collecting way ahead of our abilities and they weren't able to do it. I saw Howard in the elevator the other day and we talked like we were best friends. Mm -hmm. And there was, no, there was no fallout. There was no fallout mm -hmm. that you wasted hours of my time. It was we're building a relationship. Mm -hmm. So that side exists rampant out there. I did tell the Mary Boone story because I always think it's very funny and I always want to know, was it Adam? <laughs> <laughs> um, can I just see uh, some show of hands? How many people have questions? Because I want to manage our time highly efficiently. Okay, only one. Okay, good. So just moving right on and then we'll go to the questions very shortly. You talked about enforcement. That brings up to me the question of the highly touted self-regulation. Does self-regulation really work when it comes to highly contentious issues? And how do you self-regulate without a stick? Or do you have a stick? You know, I think some of these things are best left to the court system. Uh -huh. um, the really serious issues. Um, the ADAA, for instance, is not a policing organization. We don't do that. We have a code of ethics. And by signing on the dotted line, uh, you agree to work by those. Um, I think there are a lot of things also for which there are no legal precedents, and we are still figuring that out. I think in terms of regulation, we need to decide what it is that we want to regulate because otherwise we're going to be figuring it out on the job and it's going to become cumbersome and it's going to take forever. Do you want to regulate whether somebody is buying for investment value, for personal enjoyment, uh, or for speculation? I mean, these are things that the Internal Revenue Service determines. These are the things that maybe could be determined by the legal realm. Um, do you want to regulate if somebody buys a horizontal painting and decides that they'd prefer to hang it vertically? I mean. I think it takes a big, <laughs> I mean, there are well, a lot of issues. Up. There are a lot of issues here. 
and that has been done. Yeah. So I, where Lindsay <laughs> was going a little bit is, because you can go either side of all these, I think we're often confusing the word regulations with good morals. And those, it's, very, it's very hard to regulate morality, but I think that's, that tends to be the, I keep going to the moral side as opposed to the, regu the, right. regu the regulation right. side. But that's the side we look for in any business. I I, can, I'm sorry, sorry. I'm just going to say, because you brought up real estate. You know, you know you buy a piece of real estate, you're going to pay, what, a 6% broker fee or whatever it is. You know, it's sort of very transparent. 6.5. 6.5. Uh, <laughs> Canadian? So then yeah. I'm wondering, you know, because I, as a reporter over years, you know, when you see the lawsuits emerge and then you see these sometimes gigantic commissions, sometimes, on these transactions, sometimes almost equal to the purchase price, you know, because there's so many parties involved. Sometimes <laughs> it's it's it maybe an exception, but I just do think that you know regulation, horizontal, vertical, not so much. But there are a lot of things that that could benefit. Mm -hmm. But where ethics, where someone's pressed or someone has an opportunity, you know, yeah. they just take advantage. Pierre, quickly because I want to ask. Uh, question. Uh, yeah. I was just still thinking uh, about about secret commissions as as Lindsay was speaking. I mean, that to my mind is an area where you know a little bit more regulation would be helpful. Um, education, I would say, is a starting point because many people don't really get it that if they act as agent for you know a collector and and sell their work. Um, it's not on to take money from you know other parties and not disclosing that. Um, for some people, that's kind of a surprise, and you know that maybe is understandable. So education first, but there are people who can't, you know, who for whom education, you know, is Ca not caveat enough. emptor. They say a question from the gentleman. Please state your name. We are being taped. Name and affiliation, if you like. La Serve Collector. Um, oh wait, we know who you are. Of course, because we can't see you, so we can only okay. hear you. But we recognize your voice. Of course. Um, I think <coughs> we agree that um, the art market has been working very well as a club because you know anything you would be outside of the line. We spoke about Mary Bone; you would be excluded. The thing that has changed is the, the amount of money that has been involved. And in fact, what happened is that saying that the art market is rotten and need urgent regulation is certainly not right. But there are enough um, bad people on the side, and we've been, you've been mentioning that at the end of your, of your mention, you said more regulation, when at the beginning you said regulation is no good. Um, you spoke about the example of Mary Bone, uh, it's very nice, but the Alec Baldwin case is less, uh, um, uh, let's say, shining uh, in terms of attitude. So we have enough examples of things that are not working. Let, starting even from me buying a work here in Art Basel, we know the problem of non-payment of acquisition. You know, is there a rule to protect the gallerists, even themselves? And is there a possibility to improve the protection of artists? Because it happens that um, the galleries will pay the art fair uh, fee before paying their artists. You know, in, in New York, there is a regulation which forces a separate account. We don't have it in any other countries. So there are many, many, many reasons. Let's not talk about the, the, um, the art advisors, the, the scandals, you know, the uh, lawsuits, uh, Perry Rubinstein. I mean, so many of them right now. And, and Adam was mentioning that we should let co courts go, and I would love let to let court go, but what happened in the Knudler case is that it was settled out of, um, out of courts, and would have loved to have some uh, element of um, jurisprudence to help us in the future, but we were even uh, deprived of that. Mm. So, you know, why were, because everybody says, no, we don't need any regulation, but why were there regulation, you know, self-regulator in other, 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 that will be my question. Why were, were they um, self-regulation in other professions? It's not to, um, to clean up the 90% of the, to make the life harder of the 90% that are working well. It's about cleaning up the 10% while tainting the whole profession. And right now, I think that we're reaching a point where um, it is counterproductive to, less do, to let those leeches and sharks and you know, um, uh, piranhas going around and eating bits and pieces of the, of the whole thing. Um, it's counterproductive because a new buyer would be so scared to get into that jungle that he could maybe uh, move out. 
So, you know, there's been self-regulation in every other profession, whether it's real estate, stockbrokers, um, you know, school teacher, actors, and whatever. Why? Is to make the difference between the ones that are following the rules, addicting the rules, and applying the rules, vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the ones that are not trust, uh, trustworthy. I think it's time to do it. Any response? I was uh, just going to say, as an add-on to this, you know, there's there is a, a weakening. I alluded to the journalists in the in the art world. I think there's there's a diminishment of resources there, and they would provide a check sometimes and illuminate some of these problems. And at a moment where you don't have that, I mean, the reason I discovered that Salander O'Reilly was even having issues was I think he got booted out of the the art fair, and then the art dealer association and I said hmm, what's happening and then started sniffing around you know and then ev eventually lawsuits happened but yeah it's true I mean I I would I would agree with you that that there does need to be some kind of an oversight but it's a question of how do you not mess things up for the 90 yeah. percent I mean self-regulation has has positives definitely um, peer pressure and and things like that uh, I I find that the problem comes when you start wondering well who is going to enforce self-regulation. And it's particularly difficult in, in the dealer's market, I think, because um, so many dealers buy together. And so they have, you know, common interests, financial interests. And, and I can't really see how, you know, a dealer who has a common interest with another dealer would st stand as a judge to that dealer. I mean, th th there are so many th that would mm -hmm. create some, some un unbearable tension. Mm -hmm. So I think self-regulation, yes. But it, ha it is quite limited, and, and that's why I was talking about enforcement of regulation um, through the courts. Well, speaking of self-regulation, uh, it's my job to regulate our time, so we're coming to the end of. Um, uh, but there I do see it. Will, okay, uh, two hands have gone up, and we're going to do this quickly, uh, just very quickly here, because we we are, you know, close okay. to our. My name is Chris, and I'm from uh, Warsaw, Poland. I have a question to Bob and uh, Olaf. Uh, there, was, there was plenty of talk about the closed doors, and the question is to what extent do you see uh, positive spillovers from the art world industry towards other industries, uh, opening the doors to, soci to societies and positive spillovers, maybe also on the side of the on the commercial way of spillovers towards other industries. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I consider Mary Boone a friend, and I would deal with Mary today. And I think <laughs> I think the stories exaggerate. What I learned from my Mary Boone thing is don't wear a ripped ski jacket. I think that's where <laughs> I go. But but on the closed doors, if you go into the Rolex dealer, uh, anybody can buy the Rolex is in the store, but the limited edition, that ends up getting sold to the person who has 42 watches and is going to a safe place. I don't know, I don't know how you change the closed doors, but I, I think the, how we changed it is we built relationships. The Howard story I told. I started doing that in, in the 80s and into the 90s is build relationships. Mary began to trust me and we could, carry, we could carry on that relationship. I meant to tell the story as I think it's, it, it's, 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 it's sort of a very obvious one that stands out, but it wasn't meant to hurt Mary as much because we built a relationship. Um, I feel really bad, but I'm getting a signal to finish up, so I'm going to ask our last question, uh, which may allow you to say what you would have said. And I'm sorry for the gentleman, but maybe afterwards you can ask. So first of all, just to conclude, I think there's a variety of viewpoints have been expressed. There's certainly, uh, I think the headline reads, a uh, great deal of skepticism about regulation, but not necessarily a lack of recognition of what Alain said, although then he immediately departed, which is that there are some <laughs> bad eggs uh, and, 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 and a little bit, that, that, that there's areas here that need to be tweaked and, and sorted out. Uh, I promised at the beginning that we would not end without giving you something concrete and specific. So I'm going to put everyone on the spot and ask a last question. We're going to start with Adam. I'm going to finish with Bob. Just go. And you can please answer succinctly. If there is one practical step, whether it's a regulation or some new kind of entity or data, uh, one specific innovation or improvement, 
that could make our industry, yes, industry, work better, what would you propose uh, to the people here and to everybody else listening? We'll start with Adam. I'll be succinct. One of the best ways for these decisions to come about is when the art world as an entity comes together in the best way it possibly can. How does that happen? How do we get everybody under one roof? I think a starting point would be, as we do in the ADAA with the art show, for each of the art fairs to take a position on this subject mm -hmm. and come up with a code of ethics or a code of conduct that they require all of their participants to abide by, both as exhibitors and as business people independently. So art fairs could take a bigger role in also helping to create these codes of ethics. Yeah, they're an important part of the um, cultural ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And if they want to step up to being more than just a commercial entity, they have educational platforms, they do mm -hmm. all of these things, this might be an interesting direction for mm -hmm. them to go in. Lindsay, use the mic. My heavens. <laughs> you can sigh <laughs> into the mic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, my fantasy is that there would be an index created where all art sales would be recorded in total detail and available in public record for journalists to analyze and... Uh, and, and other procure. market participants. Yeah, and other market participants, but that is like the, uh, the utopian, okay. not never going to happen. We believe. Yeah. Okay, Pierre. Well, as I, as I said, I, I'm not a firm believer in, in more regulation. I'm a believer in, in, in better regulation and also in, in well, more enforcement and looking of existing regulations and perhaps looking at certain areas where, you know, where, where we see court cases again and again and again, like secret commissions and certain practices in the auction room that I think would benefit from, uh, from more regulation. I'm not sure that was a real answer, but there's a lawyer who knows how to answer a question without actually giving a specific answer. Thank you very much, Olaf. A very simple wish. Pay your artists well and pay them promptly. I still hear too many stories of artists that don't get paid and or either have to beg endlessly to get their part of the commission. And let's not forget that it's in the end the artist that makes all of this possible. I don't care too much about a collector every now and then getting a bad deal, but I do care a lot about an artist getting cut out of the financial part. Okay, so Bob, and last word is yours. You know, it, I think if we always put the artist first, it all becomes very easy to put it all together and agreeing with part of what you said. <laughs> but I, I really think is learning to, I, I think as humans we can take the bad news, we just want to know the lines we have to color within. And I think, that there's a lot of areas in the art world where, where we're afraid to break the news that no, that's not available because we're gonna hold it for two years for a museum. But mm -hmm. let everybody know the lines are coloring within and then they may walk away unhappy, but at least they know why they're unhappy or they walk away why they're happy. And I, I think we just have to get much more conversational and that takes engagement. Well, I think we've been conversational today, so thank you very much for all of your thoughts. Thank you all of you for staying and uh, enjoy the show. Thank you.